Welcome back to Eminent 2021 online conference. We are very excited to see you all here and to follow the discussions with you from our distinguished guests. We hope that our speakers have provided you with interesting insights and information about the importance of inclusion when we discuss digital education. The next roundtable will exchange on the added value that European cooperation can bring in the area of digital education, both at the EU and country level. Panelists will also discuss about the new recovery and resilience facility instrument in the, of the European Union and the supported national strategies for education. European Schoolnet's senior analyst, Lydia Kreil, is coordinating the discussion. Lydia, welcome. Thank you, Constantinos. I'll let you now introduce uh, guests and uh, looking forward to the exchange. Uh, thank you, Constantinos, for kind uh, introduction and good afternoon to all eminent 2021 participants. So our guests today are Dr. Georgi Dimitrov, Head of Digital Education Unit in DGAC at European Commission, who is leading development and implementation of Digital Education Action Plan, working with experts on the ethical use of AI and data in education and on tackling disinformation and promoting digital literacy through education. Welcome, Georgi. Minister Niki Kerameus from, uh, from the Minister of Education and Religious Affairs from Greece, who have been leading digital transformation of schools and development of teachers and students' digital skills. Welcome, Minister Kerameus. Dr. Zoltan Maruja, State Secretary for Public Education from Hungary, leading curricular reform and activities focused on enabling disadvantaged children to make up for learning loss. Welcome, Dr. Maruja and Professor Alejandro Tiara Ferrer, Secretary of State of Education from Spain, whose experience from the National Distance Education University and several international organizations helped in leading further development and evaluation of education system in Spain. Warm welcome to all of you, and I do hope that Dr. Maruja will join us uh, in a minute. Uh, in the first part of the uh, today's round table, we are going to, to hear introduction in interventions from each of the panelists. So we are first going to start from the EU perspective. Dr. Dimitrov, what can you share with us about the structured dialogue with member states on digital education and skills in addressing the digital transformation of education and training system in an integrated whole government approach across a number of different policy areas? Georgi, floor is yours. Good afternoon, Good Lydia. Afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, Minister Kerameos, uh, uh, Professor Ferrer and Dr. Uh, Marusha. Very pleased to be here. Thank you uh, to the European Schoolnet for inviting the Commission to this very important conference. I will share um, with you in a second um, a slide uh, set which I would use for a very brief uh, overview of the um, subject that I would like to address. Hoping that you can see this, uh, I have um, put a title for the um, uh, presentation, Working Together for Stronger Digital Education and Skills, which I believe is at the core of the discussion, of course, for inclusiveness. Let me start um, by saying um, something which all of you have heard now, uh, but it is important to still recall that um, with the COVID uh, crisis, we have seen a very large scale shift to what some call emergency driven um, remote learning in any case distance and online learning forms which have affected uh, almost uh, well one fourth of the um, planet's population if we count that and uh, virtually everyone around the world has been affected by it if they were going to schools or if they were teaching and um, such a simultaneous external shock uh, has of course unprecedented um, uh, nature and uh, it has led for many uh, to the use of technology uh, for many for the first time in education and training which um, has many opportunities on the one side for students and educators but on the other side of course it has very significant challenges and we just need to think about um, access inclusiveness equity these are the subjects which are at the core of this conference today now, when it comes to the transformation of education uh, for the digital age, which is part of um, my work, we have observed that um, in doing so, 
we have to work much more closely together than so far. And this means that we have to combine forces with public, non-governmental uh, and private sector. This type of cooperation is very important uh, in order to arrive to what we call a truly effective and inclusive digital education ecosystem. Now, if we um, look at what the response of the European Union was at, uh, to the COVID-19 crisis in uh, the field of education, then obviously you mentioned it, Lydia, um, the Digital Education Action Plan is a very important flagship policy, but by no means um, isolated. On the contrary, it is integrated in the European education area, which we have um, also uh, proposed not that uh, long ago, which is our vision for the, uh, a deepening cooperation at EU level. The Digital Compass, which is our high-level long-term targets for 2030. Of course, the next generation EU or a resilience and recovery facility that is subject to the discussion today. And finally, our vision for a Europe fit for the digital age. My main point with this is to transmit the message that when it comes to digital education, it is part of a larger transformation in our society and economy. Now, looking at the resilience and recovery facility, which of course all of you know uh, very, very well, um, we um, uh, have to start with the fact that not all of them are completed by now, but we are almost there. And what is clear is that we see that most, if not all, member states have identified digital education as a strategic priority. Um, we can see that purely from the numbers of the expenditure, which is devoted to them, but we are also seeing it into the projects. And I'm um, sure that the esteemed uh, panelists will also share more about it so that we can see also the concrete examples of what the member states are doing in this field, which is uh, quite impressive. And what is also um, going to happen is that while we are looking now forward into the next stage uh, of the process with the implementation of the RRF, as we call them, uh, member states may need uh, more specific guidance, support from the European Commission. Why? Because um, some of these investments, uh, as big as they are, would sometimes need to be also accompanied by uh, policy reform. This is because digital education is very complex in its nature, and it is sufficient to look at the right-hand side of this slide to just see maybe the top five investment areas that we have identified, and they are very, very diverse, as you can tell. Digital infrastructure, connectivity, uh, devices, the skills uh, part, the upskilling of the adult population, but on the other side, very, very important, the teacher training of digital skills, and of course, there are also very technical factors such as platforms. If we are to bring all of this together, we would need to consider this in a very integrated fashion. Now, um, the issue that we are having in front of us is the need to collaborate. Um, we have sufficient strategies and action plans. And what we need now is to collaborate more closely in terms of um, digital education, uh, a vision that can be achieved from um, the perspective of the Commission at different levels, all of them equally important uh, at political level uh, through the structured dialogue on digital education and skills, but also, uh, for example, at the technical level through the Digital Education Hub. And just a few words on the structured dialogue. Let me start by saying that the um, Structured Dialogue was announced by the President of the Commission, um, von der Leyen, in the State of the Union address in September, when she said that digital education and skills need leaders' attention and structured dialogue at top level. This is why also the name comes from there. This statement was echoed by the heads of state in the European Council conclusions of, of October, which underlined the need to focus, in particular, on digital skills in education in order to ensure Europe's digital transformation drives growth, uh, job creation and competitiveness, among others, and inclusiveness. And in order to deliver on this in October, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, nine commissioners, uh, under the guidance of Executive Vice President uh, Margarete Vestager, who is responsible for Europe fit for the digital age, launched the kickoff of this structured dialogue. 
And um, it is important to say that um, with this dialogue, we would like to support the member states in the digital transformation of their education and training systems in an integrated, coherent, and more ambition, uh, ambitious way. Very important is to bring together different parts of the government, as well as stakeholders, private, public sector, social partners. Um, why? Because digital education cuts across several different policy areas, and they range from, of course, education and training, but also include social policies, telecoms, um, but also finance. And all of this um, is um, important, equally important, in order to develop inclusive and effective digital education. Let me just mention that this structured dialogue is an action of the Digital Education Action Plan. However, it has become a little bit more prominent than we initially were planning for it uh, in September last year, because it has now included the aspect of digital skills, which you can also see in the title. Let me mention that there are five pillars, and we want to be very pragmatic about this dialogue. It is about really doing and um, implementing and therefore, we have proposed five specific pillars which are important in order to go through this dialogue together with the member states. Investment, obviously very important. We all know that um, investment in equipment, for example, needs also investment in um, the teacher skills. Um, otherwise, uh, things don't work. The place of digital competences in education and training systems um, this is about how digital competences are uh, de delivered. Is it a uh, core subject, such as, for example, computer science, or is it a horizontal type of uh, delivery? The governance of digital education and skills, I mentioned the different policy areas. It is very important that we have a coordinated, a more coherent approach um, in order to achieve more effective results. The, re the, the role of industry, social partners, and last but not least, of course, the content of digital competence frameworks. Um, it is very important to be aware that the digital skills and competences always evolve because we have just a very rapid digital transformation going on. So we cannot work with one set of competences, uh, which was perhaps relevant uh, some 15 years ago, and we need to constantly revisit this. Uh, perhaps um, the last slide which I would like to use for the structured dialogue is that this is a very concrete proposal and um, we are envisaging to focus uh, 2022 on this structured dialogue. In fact, we have a limitation in terms of time that we have proposed, uh, which is the next 12 months. Um, we were uh, already having the first exchange, which was last week um, at the Education Council. Uh, and uh, which launched uh, a series of discussions which we expect to also continue through other council configurations. I mentioned some of them, uh, maybe the uh, social, um, but also the um, uh, finance and uh, the telecoms. And what we really expect from this is quite concrete. First of all, we would like to have a shared diagnosis and understanding on the situation and perspectives at national level. And we believe that from the feedback which we heard at the council discussion, there is a lot of awareness of how important this subject is. Um, the second um, uh, is that we are working on a specific um, outcome, which is more in the toolbox of the European Commission's work, which in this case are council recommendations on the enabling factors for successful digital education, but also on improving the provision of digital skills. And um, we also are going to feed with this process into the negotiations of the um, specific program, which is called Path to the Digital Decade, which, by the way, is another sign that we are taking an integrated, holistic view, which um, means that we are combining also in the European Commission different services or directorate generals that work together um, on this structured dialogue. I would like to uh, conclude with one specific uh, slide, and this is the last one. Um, and um, I would like to um, uh, stress that uh, for us, um, we consider digital education and skills now a strategic priority in the long-term digital transformation. 
And this opens a set of new challenges, which perhaps are not um, um, all, all, all of them well known to us, especially those of us that work in the education field. Uh, there is a lot of technicalities and complexities, but this can be addressed with cooperation and coherence, uh, both at EU level, but of course, first and foremost, at national level. And um, we are uh, committed to support also the member states in making the best use of the resources. Uh, this is why uh, for the Commission, through an initiative such as the Structured Dialogue on Digital Education and Skills, we offer our part and we are inviting also the member states to come along into this uh, very, very important um, aspect of making our education and training systems fit for the digital age, which basically means um, effective, high quality and inclusive uh, education and training systems. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dimitrov, uh, for this overview and introduction for the country-specific actions. I completely agree with you that RRF plans are impressive. And uh, with all things you mentioned in your presentation, I think we all will be very, very busy <laughs> next year and probably next five years with different activities. But we also shared the common goal, have a better and more resilient education. So thank you, Dr. Dimitri. And now we are going to visit the Greece. So Minister Kerameos, how is the recovery and resilience facility instrument in the education connected with digital priorities? Please tell us more about Greek plans for the recovery of education. Thank the floor is yours. Okay. Good afternoon to all, uh, dear Mr. Dimitrov, uh, fellow speakers, ladies and gentlemen. It's a true pleasure to be here with you today to discuss this most important issue on the transformation of our education systems and the role that the Resilience and Recovery Fund uh, can play in achieving this goal of transformation of education. And I would say that there's no doubt that the pandemic uh, has been a major shock in general and a major shock to education systems. But at the same time, I would say that the pandemic has offered us the opportunity to accelerate the pace of our reforms. So in Greece, we have set five strategic targets, uh, five broad policy areas, which aim to address five key challenges of the Greek education system. And those five policies, which I will outline in a second, match, come and match with our objectives through the RRF plan. So those five strategic targets are the following. The first one has to do with skills, upgrading skills, both soft and digital, to narrow the gap in skills. The second one has to do with strengthening the link to the market and addressing uh, mismatch issues between education and the needs of society as a whole. The third one has to do with enhancing inclusion to reduce unequal access. The fourth one has to, be, ha has to do with promoting greater autonomy and accountability. And the fifth one has to do with enhancing extroversion uh, of education as a whole. So these five strategic goals um, are uh, significantly enhanced by RRF investments, which we have chosen, chosen um, through uh, EU's uh, funding. So uh, regarding skills, so skills upgrade, Greece is focusing tremendously on development of skills. Um, we're moving into an era where, of course, acquiring knowledge is very important, but it's also extremely important to cultivate skills for our youth. And moving to a system where, aside from learning, uh, children are also uh, being taught how to learn. Um, so um, in line with this strategic goal, we have introduced a new module, what we call the skills labs. The skills labs are introduced in the mandatory school program. The skills labs um, aim at cultivating both soft and uh, digital skills from the age of four till the age of 15. So imagine new thematics that are introduced in the mandatory program uh, in four different uh, themes, well-being, environment, um, uh, inclusion, diversity, and technology and science. So those are the four thematic axes on which uh, skills labs 
are based. There is a lot of digital material across all themes. I repeat, this is a mandatory in the mandatory school program. So just like you do, for instance, um, Greek and math and history in the same way, um, the skills labs include thematics such as climate change, such as sex education, such as respect of others, such as robotics and entrepreneurship. So how does the RF come into play here? The RF comes into play because we have provided for significant professional development, horizontal training for our teachers. Uh, for instance, for the skills labs, um, we have um, over 70,000 teachers who participate in the skilled labs, um, and they are enrolled for 32-hour online training courses. So we are building on, we are investing in our teachers in order to uh, further boost this reform regarding the emphasis on skills. At the same time, and with the same aim of enhancing skills, we are creating through the RRF um, robotics and STEM labs across the country in our schools. Um, and I think this all ties well with what Mr. Dimitrov was saying earlier about the emphasis on digital education, which is something I noticed too at the recent Council of Ministers in Brussels. Uh, we too in Greece, we are uh, placing tremendous emphasis on digital education. So the first um, acts, the first priority is skills upgrade. The second priority has to do with uh, bridging the gap between education and the actual needs of society, the needs of uh, the market. Uh, so we have invested a lot in vocational education and training, and we are we have proposed to use RRF funds to upgrade the entire vocational education system ecosystem, I would say. So we're using um, uh, roughly 200 million from RRF funds to upgrade the entire VET ecosystem. We're modernizing laboratory centers across VET schools. We're digitalizing educational content. Uh, we are uh, founding thematic and experimental VET schools. Uh, we are creating over 200 uh, new job profiles with an emphasis on the digital economy and sustainable energy. So that's the second priority, which has to do with bridging the gap between education and the actual needs of society and the market. The third act has to do with inclusion. Um, guaranteeing access to all has been a top priority for the Greek government. Um, and one of the very first uh, programs that we have already implemented through RRF and it's been completed is the provision of a 200 euro voucher to student aged 4 to 24 from low income backgrounds to acquire digital devices. Uh, given the pandemic, given the huge acceleration uh, of the digital transformation of education, we thought it was extremely important to ensure that nobody is left behind. And that's why we provided these vouchers across the board and over 500 thousand students in Greece benefited from these vouchers and allowed them to purchase digital um, digital devices. Um, in the same line of um, um, ensuring that nobody is left behind, um, we are undertaking great efforts uh, regarding people with disabilities um, and we have rolled out a national action plan regarding um, ensuring that no student is excluded from the education process um, at any stage of learning. The fourth act has to do with autonomy and evaluation. Uh, Greece recently, up until recently, had one of the most centralized system education system that is changing. We are decentralizing uh, the entire education system um, and that comes hand in hand with enhanced teacher training programs um, funded by the RRF uh, and further in-school support uh, in order to change this culture and of, of decentralization of the entire education system. The fifth Priority has to do with extroversion, and mostly, I would say, I would focus mostly on the extroversion of the higher education system of our universities. We're using over 800 million euros of RRF funds to boost our higher education, to increase its links with both domestic and international partners, and upgrade the quality of research. Uh, so we are using funding, RRF funding, uh, to support and upgrade research infrastructures in universities on the basis of merit. We are introducing what we call clusters of research excellence, um, where collaborative R&D projects between universities and industry will be funded to support internationally competitive research programs. Um, we are placing a lot of emphasis on a visiting professorship, professorship a scheme to attract and Greece leading academics from around uh, the world. And I would say that all of these investments in higher education come hand in hand with our legislative reforms 
which have as a target to increase uh, universities' autonomy, uh, to set up joint degrees, double degrees, dual degrees with foreign universities, to establish foreign language undergrad programs. Um, so uh, here too, the RRF comes and complements a, a major reform effort on the Greek government side um, and provides most, uh, most valuable funding in order to further enhance this reform effort. So I, I think that those five priorities that I've uh, outlined um, set in short the sense of uh, the Greek priorities in education reform and the crucial role that the RRF is playing in helping us achieve uh, these goals. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Minister Karameos. I think that Skill Labs sounds very, very interesting and that lots of us will be visiting your country and see how it works uh, in, in the schools. I hear that you are covering from the age of four to the age of 24 and all those activities planned for youth sits very well for, for the next year, which is a year uh, of youth in European Union. So uh, thank you once more again, Minister Karameos. And now we are going a little bit northern to the Hungary. Dr. Maruja, what reforms in education supported by RRF you expect to see in your country in the next few years? Please uh, tell us more about Hungarian plans for building resilience in education. Zoltan, floor is yours. I can't hear you. Sorry, yes, ladies and gentlemen, okay. Please go on. <laughs> a warm welcome to all of you. In the coming years in the public education in Hungary, digital and green transition is a priority task. Digital transition without proper infrastructure and equipment is impossible. We need school equipment that students can use privately at their homes and in the schools as well. There are topic areas in all subjects that can be easier more effectively and more efficiently to learn using digital technology in some subjects more, in others, especially in practical uh, studies less. In addition to students having computers in their hands, it's important that they study in modern, well-equipped schools and classrooms. So developments in this area will also continue in Hungary. Learning requires information sources. And in this respect, digital learning materials gain a growing importance over paper-based ones. Students acquire a considerable part or perhaps the majority of their knowledge over the internet. In order to equip them with safe, professional learning materials, we give priority to digital content development. One favorable feature in this aspect is that uh, the provision of textbooks in Hungary is a primarily a state task. So all students receive their textbooks and the digital contact developed uh, within this framework free of charge from the state. The role of teachers has also changed. The need to support educators uh, in learning new pedagogical methodologies. Therefore, we organize further trainings and workshops. We equip them with motivational tools to change their attitudes and apply their new knowledge in their daily practice. In-service teacher trainings basically serve to renew, expand and develop the knowledge and skills needed to maintain direct contact with students, to organize the activities of public educational institutions, to provide pedagogical services, to operate the examination system, to perform the measurement, assessment and evaluation tasks and to perform the management and leadership tasks of public education institutions. Hungary attaches a great importance to the green transition and to education for sustainable development. In Hungary, the Green Kindergarten Network and the Eco School Network, with their respective self-assessment and award systems, are efficient representatives of the whole school approach of ESD. In these schools, values of sustainability are present in all segments of school lives. Students are invited to take actions for the local environment and are empowered to reflect on global challenges. All school types in the spectrum of the Hungarian public education system are represented in Eco School Network, which celebrates in 21st, its 21st anniversary 
of its existence this year. Based on the national core curriculum, schools in Hungary are expected to support students in developing their sense of responsibility for the environment, for cultural values, and for the future of our communities. This is already a challenging and vital mission to them, but eco schools go beyond it. Besides the daily practice of learning, they expand ESD related activities and the value based attitudes to their community lives. On top, they organize full institutional project days and thematic weeks and take part in regional, national, and international programs. Even before the COVID pandemic, the importance of digitalization has grown steadily in all walks of life. Blood closures due to the pandemic made this process particularly important. The RRF um, demography and public education component primarily increases the resilience of the education systems by providing equal access to digital education for teachers and students and plans significant content improvements in digital education as well as digital content. Just to mention specific examples, in addition to the development of digital infrastructure, it's very important to encourage teachers to use digital tools and content as well as digital pedagogical methods and opportunities. The modern curriculum and infrastructure to schools digital tools and the collaboration space together have a huge potential for the future. The basic task of the public education system is to prepare children for the future. In this case, through the development of digital competencies for learning, working and using digital services of the 21st century. The national core curriculum itself emphasizes this task. Digital competence includes the main computer applications, word processing, data spreadsheets, databases, information storage and management, internet capabilities and communication via electronic media, information sharing, collaborative networking. In order to develop this, we would like to place even more emphasis on digital pedagogical solutions for all development of basic skills, but also provide incentives for disadvantaged students and contributing to the imp improvement of their learning outcomes. Our current goal is to equip schools with the best digital tools possible to develop students' creativity and problem-solving thinking. At the same time, this shall increase students' motivation, preventing early school leaving and contribute to our students' competitiveness in the labor market in the long run. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maruja. Uh, it is very interesting to hear how I plan improvement in infrastructure and equipment, having a network of green kindergartens and school, and especially motivation tools and incentives for teachers. I see that you agree with the Minister Kermeos that investment in teachers are always paid back with improvement in education system. So thank you again, Dr. Maruja, and we are going to Spain now. Professor Ferrer, how will be the modernization of education supported in pedagogical and organizational way? Please tell us more about Spanish recovery and resilience plans for education. Alejandro, floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much. I hope you, you can hear me. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, I, I have to say that Spain is now committed to a process of reform in education uh, covering uh, several fields and having several uh, orientations. Uh, we are in a process of curriculum reform. Also, we are uh, um, fostering and developing early childhood for, 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 for children. Uh, uh, vocational training is also a very important strand of reform. We are also starting to, to, to make some change in, in teaching profession. And, and, and also inclus inclusive education is a, is, is a key priority for us. Well, uh, dealing specifically to digitalization, I have to mention the Spanish plan for digitalization and digital competences of the educa educational system, that's the full name, and it is fully aligned with the initiatives of the European Commission, and in particular to the new Digital Education Action Plan 21-27, which uh, uh, Georgi Dimitrov referred 
before. Uh, we have also been developing a strategic plan for vocational training with a strong component related to digitalization, which I should also mention. Well, so the digitalization of society is one of, of our main axes of action reflected in the Digital Agenda 2025, which considers the education is one of the key levers uh, to promote economic growth, the reduction of inequality and increased productivity, and the use of all the opportunities that technologies offer. This uh, digitalization and digital competence plan, a short name, uh, understands um, uh, two main aspects, uh, two main aims, uh, and also lines of work. Uh, the first is the digitalization of education, and the second is the development of digital skills. So we are uh, working in that field in four main directions. First, to improve the digital competence of the educational community in general, teachers, students, but also schools as uh, learning organizations. The second is the, uh, to generalize the access to the digital media in, in, in schools. And we, we are uh, developing at school level uh, the school digital plans, uh, the equipment and connectivity needed to respond to the new demands. The first line is the creation and the promotion of open educational resources in digital format. And the fourth is the development of advanced, uh, advanced uh, digital methodologies uh, to support teachers' efforts uh, to, to respond to, to those challenges. And for instance, we have developed what we call the School of Comp Computational Thinking and Artificial Intelligence what we also call the classroom of the future uh, in, in cooperation with many companies and other entities and the uh, school collaboration within e-twinning, e which is uh, uh, an important program uh, for us. The funds of the, of, of the facility uh, program will, will support this process of modernization and transformation of the education system, of course. These, uh, these funds not only go to digitalization, but this is one important field and also is a field which is not reduced to education. It is connected with uh, other digital uh, uh, investment and, and, and programs developed through the Ministry of Economy in the Secretary of State for Digitalization and, and Artificial Intelligence, uh, with which we work uh, very closely. And we, uh, and, and we uh, organize these uh, programs through what we call in Spain, the territorial cooperation programs. We are a very decentralized country. We have to work with the 17 regions. And, and that means that we have to, to, to cooperate with them. And the main uh, scheme to do that is, is this kind of cooperation uh, plans. And the digitalization and digital competence plan is one of those, one of the most important in the in the uh, in, in in the funds of the facility so uh, through those uh, investments we aimed at uh, implementing uh, a bit more than 200,000 interactive digital classrooms which will combine the possibility of face to face and distance learning also, uh, uh, developing digital competences for, for, for about uh, 700,000 uh, teachers in the non-university sector in, in, in Spain, and the acquisition of uh, 300,000 mobile devices for the most uh, vulnerable uh, students, and the creation of a national network of digital training centers in a digital vocational training uh, plan. Uh, more uh, precisely, the Recovery and Resilience uh, Facility will support two main programs. First, we call the Program for the Digitalization of the Educational Ecosystem. I will refer about that. And second, the Program for the Improvement of Digital Teaching Competence, through which we will certify in digital skills 80% of our teachers in, uh, by the end of 2024, 
and the implementation of a school digital plan in 22,000 uh, schools. In practice, this means that within the education systems, we are going to work on digital skills with three groups in three areas. First, students. Uh, uh, we, we passed a new education law one year ago, and we are, um, uh, as, as I said before, uh, making some changes in the conception of curriculum, uh, going to a competence-based pr perspective, and uh, the, the, the development of uh, digital skills that is fully embedded in that, in that, in that project. Uh, second, teachers, uh, in, in June 2020, so one and a half year ago, we agreed and published in our official journal the National Reference Framework for the Digital Competence of Teachers, which is aligned, uh, fully aligned with one of the European Commission. And this framework is currently being updated to guide, to, to guide teacher training in Spain in this coming period. And that will be uh, an, an essential tool for uh, certification. And the third line with respect to the school approach, uh, all educational schools in Spain will develop, and we are supporting them for doing that, their own school digital plan integrated into their educational project. All schools in Spain uh, are, uh, have to develop a, 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 an educational project. And the school digital plan is a new component we are introducing in that. Some schools have, uh, have already done that, but some others are being uh, uh, supported to, to do that. So uh, <coughs> digitalizations will allow the development of a more personalized, equitable education and will transform pedagogical methodologies. We are sure that it should be like, like that. Uh, we are moving, as I said, to, towards a model of competence development in which our students learn to learn, to create, to work as a team, to understand and apply the knowledge acquired to have critical thinking and to be responsible and supportive uh, citizens. And finally, in this first uh, intervention, uh, we cannot ignore the emotion, emotional well-being of students, an issue that has uh, acquired greater relevance because of the pandemic. And we are developing some specific plans to support the most vulnerable students and giving them uh, support and orientation and guidance to, uh, well, to, to prevent all the difficulties caused and the problem caused by, by this uh, situation. The, the closure of schools and the move to distance or blended education sometimes highlighted the effect on the mental health and emotional well-being of students and, 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 and underline the benefits of the face-to-face -face education without neglecting the potential of uh, blended, blended learning. So we are uh, working with the schools, with uh, guidance uh, services, in order to, to, to give that uh, support and orientation to the students who will need it in, in, in this period. Thanks uh, for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Ferrer. I see that you will have reforms very intensive and in all level of education system in Spain and having a big country with territorial co cooperation will be a challenge for, for next few years. Very interesting sounds to me, School of Computational Thinking. And of course, I'm looking forward to hear later about uh, digital competence framework you are developing for teacher and, and the certifications you apply. But also emotional well-being of students and teachers are one of the topics on EU level. I hope Dr. Dimitra will agree <laughs> with me. I, I, as I think uh, it is part of a new uh, European semester topic of well-being will be also covered in, in the next few years. Uh, thank you, Professor Ferrer. Uh, we are going back to EU level with your lovely uh, invitation and uh, uh, introduction. 
So, Dr. Dimitri, I have two questions for you. Uh, first one will be, what are your expectations regarding collaboration and expertise sharing among EU member countries? We heard several challenges, very intensive reform and investments are planning. So what advice or recommendation would you like to share with us? Thank you. Um, as you all know, we operate in the context of subsidiarity. So I would, uh, I would be uh, very modest here in terms of uh, advice. Um, because it is very important to recognize that national education and training systems are complex. Um, they are context-related, cultural, um, and they are also uh, depending on traditions. And this is very, very important for us to respect. Uh, this makes it, of course, impossible to have one size fits all and one general type of advice. Um, at the same time, I think that um, together we are seeing a lot of uh, excellent initiatives and experience. And uh, we see success stories, which sometimes make it, let's say, big. Sometimes they don't make it big. Um, they cannot be scaled up for a variety of reasons. And I think that the challenge is to go beyond the individual success story and to reach scale. I'm, I'm using this word on purpose because it has something to do with the digital transformation and the way digital societies evolve. And it was fascinating to listen to uh, Minister Karameos and also to the um, uh, Dr. Marusha and Professor Ferrer because you could just see how uh, similar some of the challenges there are, even though we are speaking about three uh, genuinely different member states. And this is my first ex expectation, that we will achieve a shared understanding of what high-quality, inclusive digital education is, at EU level as well, and that we will work towards its main um, objectives. Uh, this is my first expectation, and I think that um, we have defined some key enabling factors, as we call them, in our digital education action plan. Uh, they are, they, uh, I will repeat now what the, the speakers have been mentioning, but um, it is just to show also the, the level of <clears throat> alignment here. It's about tackling the connectivity gaps. This is what uh, both Minister Karameos and also Professor Ferrer mentioned with the devices. It's about um, uh, equipment gaps. It's about uh, supporting education and training institutions. Uh, this was interesting to see that schools will have digital education plans. Um, addressing accessibility and availability of technology. This is very important for uh, disadvantaged people, um, in particular those that perhaps um, are excluded. Um, we, can, we have also people with, with specific, um, let's say, blind or, or, or others. This is very, very important. So we need to sort of think about this in a, a comprehensive manner and uh, agree on the, let's say, the frame of it. My second expectation is that um, through this relevance of the topic that we are all sensing, we will be able to prioritize it high on the agenda of our, uh, let's say, um, um, uh, respective um, leadership. And I think that the commission, with the setup of this initiative and with nine commissioners um, from education, um, uh, competitiveness, uh, finance, um, uh, digital. I mean, basically, it's nine out of 27. The college is not, let's say, one third of the commissioners are there. This shows also the level of common uh, ambition. And my expectation would be that we will be able to translate that ambition uh, also and support our education um, uh, colleagues, uh, the ministries uh, in the member states, because I know from personal experience that sometimes digitalization in education tends to be a little bit of a techie subject, so it is not as easy to mainstream it, but uh, the importance is, is, is actually to do that. And uh, maybe uh, what in terms of advice, if you allow me, um, our advice will always be um, resulting from the type of initiatives that we run at the European Commission. You mentioned uh, two of the working groups we have on AI and data. Uh, as well as on disin tackling disinformation through digital, uh, through education and training. These are very important um, uh, initiatives. And our advice to the member states will always be 
uh, coming from the best practice that we can accumulate at EU level and then sharing this and supporting the member states. And there are a number of them that we are currently working on in the context of the action plan. Thank you. Uh Thank you, Dr. Dimitrov. I completely agree with you. We all have to work together to make it happen. So build on each other's strength and share uh, experience, good examples, and build upon that in, in our countries as well. So my second question to you also, Dr. Dimitrov, is what is the strategy of the Commission to coordinate and support the implementation of digital education policy, including through the National Recovery and Resilience plans, what, for example, will be the role of the future Digital Education Hub? Thank you. Um, the Commission uh, started a little bit um, by its own, let's say, um, initiative and set up uh, a new unit for digital education this year. So I think that we are a little bit kind of showing that we are taking this very, very seriously. Now, in terms of um, how we can support and coordinate this implementation, um, I think that um, what is very important is that we uh, use the opportunities we already have today. Uh, for example, we have um, um, a very effective um, working group called um, Digital Education Learning, Teaching and Assessment, or short DELTA. Uh, and this working group is uh, composed of different experts from the member states, but also some other stakeholders. And with this working group, we're discussing various subjects that can inform the, um, let's say, uh, implementation of the uh, RRF plans. But you uh, alluded also to the Digital Education Hub, which is a flagship initiative of the um, uh, Commission and the Action Plan. And we have um, proposed it um, uh, one year ago. We are just about to announce um, uh, it. Maybe um, early next year will be the right time for it. And with the Digital Education Hub, we have the ambition to enable a more effective coordination and cooperation at EU level. Um, we would like to create an interface for um, practitioners, researchers, but also policymakers who can together address topics of digital education, social partners, but also private sector, because this is an important sector, both as providers and also as someone who expects from the training systems specific skills. So at the level of the Digital Education Hub, we will be enabling this type of exchange and cooperation. Um, we have three specific aspects of it, which I want to just mention. Uh, first <coughs> of all, we will have a community uh, of uh, different practitioners that will um, cooperate on uh, subjects which mostly will be coming from bottom up. So it is not going to be something where, um, let's say, we know best if I can put it like this. On the contrary, we will listen very carefully to what also the experts and the practitioners say. Second aspect of this digital uh, education hub uh, is going to be uh, its link to uh, the national uh, level. We are uh, setting up a national advisory services um, type of network, which is composed of people who are working more on the implementation of the policies not so much the strategies development, but the real implementation, because there is a lot of uh, problems there, and the devil is always in the deep. So it's important to meet your safe environment, what works, what does not work. Uh, what does not work is equally important, by the way. And this is an important aspect, the National Advisory Services. We already had the first exploratory meeting a couple of weeks ago. And we are now together defining the agenda of this. So again, it will be a co-creation type of exercise. And last but not least, our program is very important, as you know, the Erasmus program. And here we have the national agencies. And uh, next year, we're going to launch a common resource center on digital to support our national um, agencies partners, also in the way they uh, support and uh, develop digital education related policies because this is quite a technical subject. So uh, we are going to do that all in the context of this new digital education hub, which, as I mentioned, we hope to announce uh, early next year, in any case, in, in Q1, in the first quarter. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dimitro. I think that all of us are looking forward to see Digital uh, Education Hub in function. Um, 
especially because you mentioned that it will support national agencies, so this developing strength on the country level uh, as well. So now uh, that we learned more about the current state of reforms and investment, which Hungary, Greece and Spain are planning to implement as a part of RRF support, let's discuss the topic Dr. Dimitri and I already mentioned, coordination and empowerment of those actions uh, will create. So the same questions to all my guests from the ministry's uh, level. So what type of governance and coordination should be put into place for enabling cross refractions between the key pillars of our educational system? Curriculum, digital resources and pedagogy, capacity building and infrastructure. So how are you going to connect all the activities that are planned? Um, dear Minister Karameos, would you be so kind to start? Yes, with, uh, with pleasure. Um, first of all, I would start by emphasizing the fact that all of these investments and reforms are very closely intertwined. Um, I think it would be a mistake to view them independently. To the contrary, they all tie together and are bound together in an uh, ecosystem of, uh, a, a, of, of a reform project, of a, an integrated, I would say, strategic plan. And I'll give you two or three examples of how this applies to Greece. For instance, I talked about investment in digital equipment. One of the things we're planning to do is to equip most of our classrooms with, uh, with the digital devices, with digital boards. Um, so we're heavily investing in uh, digital equipment. Um, this doesn't make much sense if it's not coupled with investments of teach in teacher training. Um, so that's one example of how we bind investments and reforms and uh, together um, because both form an integral part, uh, which is uh, which is really important. Um, a second example. Uh, so we are investing heavily also in digital education as content, as far as the content is concerned. So uh, there's going to be digital material across all subject matters. We recently launched 166 new curricula um, for all ages, for all, um, uh, for all classes from the age of four till the age of 18. And there is a most significant digital component regarding the actual content. Um, but that comes hand in hand with an emphasis on digitalizing services for schools and universities. And when I say digitalizing services, I mean, for instance, e-diplomas, I mean e-registrations for everybody in school, I mean um, um, e-registration e for teachers who, uh, who take office, etc. So um, in order for this to be viewed as a whole, we're talking about digital content, but we're also talking about digital services. Um, one more example, um, investments in VET, vocational education training, learning models. Um, these are complemented by the fact that we're setting up um, thematic and experimental VET schools, um, which uh, will make it much easier to focus on specific areas and experiment in new uh, pedagogies. So I, I would say that all of these investments are intertwined. Um, they are very closely tied with the reform efforts of the Greek government, and I think the same goes um, um, with uh, our, our fellow member states. Um, so the idea is for this to be viewed as a whole, and the RRF funds come in uh, extremely handy in order to enhance these reforms, um, which are viewed as a whole as, a, an, as an integral strategic plan. Thank you. Uh Thank you, uh, Minister Karameos. Um, so, Dr. Marusha, what, how is Hungary uh, planning to connect all the dots in your plans? Thank you. In my opinion, there are two things um, need in order to make cross-reflection for quality education happen. First of all, on the one hand, it's essential to pay attention to the need that higher education prepares press service teachers to apply existing content regulations, but also to be able to adopt flexibility to a curriculum change. So while the curricula of press service teacher trainings has to be adjusted to relevant content regulations, it's important to understand that they change all the time. Therefore, teachers can stay at what they had learned before, and they have to be open to improvements. This is the foundation of all reforms, and I'm quite sure that all of my minister colleagues uh, could also uh, tell a lot about it. 
and I am uh, rather positive that it's every country, uh, in every country, one of the tightest bottlenecks is the no change attitude of the educational institutions and staff. But we have to modernize, so we have to move on. The other necessary condition is a consequence of this. The preparation and the management of school leaders and in a broader context, leadership. is the responsibility of the institution leaders to create the balance of content change, didactic renewal and the harmony of curriculum content and methods in an institution. Therefore, it's a vital that leaders uh, be selected, uh, mindfully prepared and addressed. If a school head and uh, its deputy are dedicated to systematic approach, if they know what and why they do, then it can be a success and they can take the teaching staff with them towards success. Of course, there are leaders that instinctively following the examples of their uh, predecessors become excellent uh, school principals, but the educational governance can build so slowly on this. In my view, we have to deal with training school leaders. We have to prepare school leaders for the work to be done, and we need to shape their attitudes. It's uh, through this way, through them, that educational governance can realize its aims and ensure that things finally get uh, together. Among other things, the special trainings of heads of institutions serves this purpose. According to the relevant government decree, qualification to head of institutions within the framework of the teacher specialist examination is needed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marusha. And uh, Professor Ferrer, there is a several activities planned on the national level in the Spain, very extensive activities. How will you ensure their synergy and synchronization? I can't hear you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. Well, I, 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 I would start by underlining again that recovery plans is an exceptional opportunity to reform our economies and, of course, our education systems. And we have to take profit from that. And our government is uh, fully convinced and committed to, to do that. You know? And digitalization we are talking today about is one of the key elements of these plans, not only in the field of education, but in, in, in general. At least in Spain, it is clear that. So uh, I said before that Spain is a very decentralized country uh, and so that poses uh, several uh, challenges for, for cooperation. But cooperation, in my view, has uh, uh, three different levels we have to assure. First is uh, the, the coordination inside the education system, so to say. The second is the coordination inside the government, so to say, and the third is with uh, um, uh, key, uh, key stakeholders and, 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 and other, other members, uh, entities, uh, companies, and so on, also uh, having to work uh, in close coordination with us. In the first level, so in what concerns the education system, we have, since time ago, uh, a a sectoral conference on education in which the Minister of Education, the regional ministers meet. Uh, it is very frequently, it's uh, once, uh, or once uh, a month or, or, or every two months or something like that. But this conference has different uh, committee commissions and committees for working in different fields. So um, we are now developing a special, a special effort to coordinate uh, things in relation with the recovery plans in general. And in this, uh, in, in this specific field of digitalization, we have two work groups working very hard at this time. One uh, is the teacher training work, uh, work group, which uh, takes also these issues into hand. And, and also the learning technologies uh, work group. So this, this uh, sectoral conference on education uh, is uh, one of the key, the, the key uh, bodies to assure coordination 
in all, for instance, the development of the programs we are setting under the mechanism of, of uh, recovery. Um, not only in this field of digitalization, but, but in, all, in all of them. For instance, the investments we are doing are, um, are done uh, in cooperation from the ministry and from the regional ministries. And so we have to, to be sure that they are in agreement and, and that the process uh, develops as, as it, it, it is expected and, and it was approved by the European uh, Commission. A second level of coordination is coordination among the different ministries involved in that. And I did mention before the work we, we are doing with the uh, Secretary of State for digitalization and artificial intelligence, because digitalization is, so to say, a national program covering things like the development of digital skills in businesses, companies, small companies, which in Spain are a lot, and, and it's a, a key challenge, and uh, uh, also for elder population, which sometimes has not the, the digital skills they need. Uh, in the vocational training, of course, of course, but, but also in, in education in general. Uh, I have to say that we have already uh, been uh, working with some, uh, with some uh, uh, government agencies for that. And, and, and the, the work uh, has been good, but nowadays is being, is being uh, developed to, 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 to become even stronger because we, we need that. And the third level of, of coordination uh, is with other uh, stakeholders, private entities and so on. So we, we, we have to work very closely with companies, for instance, in, in, in the development of, of, of dual vocational training. Uh, we don't need to work only with, with, with our schools, vocational schools, but also with companies, of course. And, 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 and we have uh, supported the, the, the creation of some, of, of, of some uh, bodies uh, uh, representing and, and joining people coming from different companies and, 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 and giving support to, 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 to the reform efforts we are doing and also giving their lines and their visions about uh, where we should uh, uh, advance. And, and we welcome very much this uh, commitment from big, uh, not only big, but, but, but very big uh, uh, Spanish uh, enterprises and companies uh, working together with us in all in, in all that field, not only in the most um, concrete field of equipment and so on, of course, and, 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 and connectivity and so on, but also in, in the development of digital skills, which is uh, and, 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 develop, and developing new materials and new uh, programs and so on, which is uh, something they have a lot, a, 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 a lot of knowledge and, and, and they can work uh, together with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Ferrer. Um, I think I could build upon your uh, intervention with my next question for Dr. Dimitrov. So we heard about connection among the interest industry partners, private companies, schools, education, developing vocational education as well. So uh, when we look ahead, what should be the role of commission for supporting the digital education transition of a member states? So um, I think that the role of the Commission in supporting the digital uh, transition will not be fundamentally different from what the Commission has been doing in the field of education and training. Uh, there are three main aspects which I think we are, um, let's say, um, our core business in this field. Um, one is in the field of policy um, development uh, recommendations and tools. And uh, for instance, earlier uh, this year, we adopted the blended learning um, uh, proposal for a council recommendation. This was in the meantime also um, then adopted. And um, this is the result of um, working together at policy level with member states. And I believe that uh, it will be in areas which are cutting across um, all member states where we can provide um, added value. Uh, an example which is upcoming, not one in the past, is um, 
the guidelines that we are working together with an expert group on AI and data in education and training. Um, the reality is that AI does not stop at national borders. It, it does not uh, stop at continents. It, it, uh, it is a new type of technology. Uh, data is a new type of, of uh, reality. And we need to support our educators and teachers who are facing very, very similar problems independent of uh, where they are. And uh, we have a number of these type of um, recommendations, or let's call them frameworks. The DigiConf was mentioned. We're going to present its update, by the way, in January or in February. Uh, we have a new action on digital education content. I was very interesting to listen to uh, also the examples from, uh, from Hungary. So this is the first area. And I think we're going to be focused and continue to propose um, um, initiatives which are of added value for the entire EU. The second aspect is to look at the funding and how we can uh, create even more synergies at the funding instrument level, because we do have some of those that uh, tackle digital education and skills. The RRF is obviously the biggest um, one and unprecedented instrument so far, um, but we do have also some others, um, uh, notably the Erasmus program. Uh, the call was launched just two weeks ago, and the budget, the annual budget of the Erasmus program um, now is 2 billion euros. So it is very, very significant. And we have, for example, there under the cooperation actions, we have um, um, uh, support to digital transformation plans of any type of education and training institution. It doesn't matter, school, university, vet. Um, so these type of programs um, also with uh, the digital program, which supports more the advanced uh, level of skills, all of this needs to be complementary to each other. Um, and we know that it takes a lot of work to create coherence um, between and among the policies. And it was mentioned very, very, I think, um, on the spot that this is very, very important point to have um, a whole uh, integrated approach. So this um, aspect on the funding means that given the higher demand for digital education and skills funding, uh, we will have to do more in terms of creating more coherence. So going forward, this would be the second aspect that I see for us in how we can drive this digital transition in education and support the member states. And the third aspect uh, would be uh, really, again, another core business um, point for us, which is really to enable and to maintain cooperation and exchange of best practice. But I do believe that we have to go a bit deeper and a bit wider. Uh, why? Because we have new and important developments such as the education technology field. Uh, we need to listen to what is happening uh, on the side of the private sector, who is supplying education and training systems with solutions. And we need to be aware that they have to reflect also the values that we have. So um, on the other side, there is also a lot of um, important emerging technologies, which are um, probably to, to, to many people sounding like they are very far away, uh, like the AI, but they are coming and they are there. And so we need to widen our cooperation mechanisms. This is why the hub would be this interface with a deeper sort of roots and wider community. Um, and also we need to be listening more and more to the also to the citizens and to what actually the needs are, because often innovation comes from uh, that type of, let's say, experience. So it's a bit of a wider, if you like, uh, mandate there that I see for the cooperation part. Um, and this would be the, the three aspects that I can think of. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dimitro. Uh, knowing the busy schedule for the work group of AI and data in education, I'm looking forward to the, all the documents <laughs> European Commission will publish next year. And I'm really sure that it will help with recommendations, with guidelines covering children's rights, data protections, which is the same topic for all of us uh, in education. So it's the same for the old country. So looking forward to read that and the experts' view uh, on that. So uh, thank you, Dr. Dimitri. Minister Kerameos, a question for you. Uh, in the Greek Recovery and Resilience Plan, we can read about the Digital Education Action Plan, which includes the revision of curricula. So what are your plans for the upgrade of the curricula? What will be happen in Greek curriculum next year? Well, actually, it has already happened. We recently, just last week, presented uh, 166 new curricula 
uh, for all classes uh, from preschool, the age of four, uh, to high school, the age of 18. So 166 fully revamped curricula. The large majority are new and the um, a, a smaller uh, number percentage um, is uh, simply updated older curricula. Um, so we're talking about new curricula across all school units and all learning fields. I, in a nutshell, I would say the following. Um, we have changed what students learn um, uh, in a sense that the curricula have been updated um, and to take into account also the development of sciences and society. I will give you an example. In philosophy, for instance, we're introducing modules on bioethics uh, and ethics of artificial intelligence. We're also changing not only what students learn, but how students learn. And I'll give you an example, which I will draw from the history class. So in history, instead of focusing um, um, uh, intensively on uh, learning by heart uh, historical facts, we have taken a much more creative approach. For instance, students may be called upon uh, to write a letter as if they are a specific historical person um, to, uh, in a, I would say, in a, uh, in a role play, in a historical role play, they will uh, act as if they are that, that specific uh, historical person, um, taking into account all facts of the time and all data regarding the specific historical period. Um, and that's uh, a new approach that entails, I think, a more in-depth and critical analysis um, of uh, historical facts. The third thing that's changed in all curricula is the digital dimension. We will now have a digital dimension across all curricula, and we're talking about digital material, about use of digital tools and devices. I'll give you there too an example. In geography, for instance, students will be asked to engage in digital cartography, uh, or they will be invited to take virtual field trips, field trips in museums and places of interest around the world. And I would like to close with one personal experience which has really marked me. Um, a couple of months ago, I visited the public school uh, outside of Athens in the south of Greece. Uh, I tried to visit as many schools as possible. And this is, uh, you know, well, schools are operating at the time normally, we're operating at the time normally. This was a 17-year-old. Um, so I enter the classroom, I go straight to see the kids, um, but I understand that something's happening behind my back, something's happening on the blackboard. So I'm like, well, you know, what's going on? So the kids go, you know, uh, right now we're connected. I'm like, connected with whom? Like we're connected with CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, and we're connected with the Athens Polytechnic School. And I, you know, and I was thinking, had somebody told me this two years ago, for instance, in the public school of Greece, um, uh, outside of Athens, um, students in the regular classroom, uh, in, in a regular um, context, you know, of, of an operating school, that they would be connected to CERN and to a Greek university, um, you know, I think it would have been a far-fetched thought, yet now it's a reality. And that's a huge challenge, I would say, how we can build on all that was achieved during the pandemic in order to enrich even more in-class learning. And the new curricula that Greece has developed, 166 new curricula, take fully into account this digital dimension, um, both in terms of equipment, but also in terms of content and digital um, experience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Karameos. I agree with you, digital technology, it enables different connections. For example, I'm in Croatia now, and each of you in a different country, in a different state, so, and we, we can make com communication and collaboration uh, together. So uh, we also mentioned equipment and um, lots of participants uh, in our chat, uh, video conference chat, mentioned how uh, equipment will be insured. So a question for you, Dr. Mar Marusha. I've seen that uh, you are planning different visualization and problem solving tools. So what kind of equipment is planned in the Hungary? How will it be supported? And how will, we, how will it influence and support students and families? <clears throat> Thank you. An important goal of the planned investment is to place it in a framework of a strategic uh, reform. The mentioned modern tools are very diverse, starting with the most up-to-date visualization tools, interactive panels, complementing classroom infrastructure through tools that develop student creativity and problem-solving mindset that are uh, robotic tools, uh, drones, uh, all the way to toolkits developing programming skills. 
these tools can significantly increase student motivation, prevent early, early school living, and help students to acquire digital competencies, such as programming skills that makes them competitive in the labor market in the future. As part of the project, we will provide the above mentioned tools and equipment to all primary and public secondary schools, altogether 3,100 institutions. In addition to the acquisition of the equipment list above um, and taking further process started in previous years, a comprehensive laptop acquisition program will be started in Hungary, including both uh, teachers and students in public education. According to our plans, by the end of the program in the year 2025, all students from grade 5 up to grade 12 in public education, that means 560,000 students in a four years period and 52,000 teachers who haven't received a notebook for personal use in the last three years, uh, they will be able to work and study on modern laptops. As a result of the program, uh, students can take advantage of digital pedagogy and digital learning in schools as well as at home. This investment will also serve the purpose of the digital transition and compensation of disadvantages. And disadvantaged students will have an equal opportunity to acquire knowledge. The provision of modern digital content and the development of uh, and operation of a program supporting and motivating the pedagogical application of digital educational tools and methodologies for teachers will also be implemented uh, in line with the planned infrastructural development. We plan about 30,000 teachers, that means 25% of full-time teachers in schools will be involved in developing, testing and share, sharing realistic, usable digital pedagogical solutions, um, digital pedagogy aids and methods working according to uh, help uh, methodological guidelines and sharing it with each other and with the whole community of teachers. We hope that the completed materials can be easily integrated into the practice of teaching. Thank you, Dr. Marusha. Uh, it really makes me happy as a teaching, uh, with my teaching background, to see so many excellent activities and that countries thought about several aspects, how to use digital technology, but also how to improve education system, build digital competences, uh, develop modern pedagogical approaches uh, in schools in all level uh, of education. That also leads me to my final question to the Professor Ferrer. So in a Spanish recovery and resilience plan, there were several actions for digital transformation of education. One of the actions that caught my eye also is including the certification on digital skills of at least 80% of 700,000 teachers. So how are you planning to organize such a certification? What today's teachers have to know to pass the exam or reach the required level in Spain? Thank you. Well, as you may imagine, certifying the digital competence of almost uh, 560,000, so 80 percent of 700,000, uh, is, uh, is a real and unprecedented challenge for, for the country. Well, um, uh, we, we were thinking a lot about uh, before taking that commitment, as you can imagine. But in fact, uh, we started in, 19, uh, in 2019 uh, to think about how to develop the, the digital skills of, of teachers. Not only that, as I said before, but teachers, uh, um, because we thought it was a really a need uh, for, this, for the development of the Spanish education system. And we started to work in that national reference framework for the digital competence I, I did mention before. And this uh, framework is uh, similar to other frameworks we have developed at, at, at the European level, the, the, the language framework and, and, and so others. So including some general competences, uh, so, uh, each one with uh, some specific competences and different levels of acquisition. Uh, a similar system like the language uh, framework from A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2, 
so with different levels of progression in, in, in each one of the, of the, of the competences. No? So this is one of the main pillars of this model uh, we are trying to, to develop. Uh, we, uh, because it allows to establish a progressive model. So it's not a, 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 a yes or no uh, system of selling well, the, 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 the competence is acquired or not, but uh, with different levels of acquisition. And it is a, 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 key, a, key, a key point. As I said before, we are now revising this, this uh, framework to make some small adjustments to, to be used as a, as a tool for, for, for certification. Uh, second, uh, the Spanish Ministry of Education and Vocational Training and the regional uh, uh, ministries, are, uh, we are working together on a set of agreed requirements for the, for the certification process. So we are now working on that. We started before to work on that. And our idea is to have to have a, 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 an agreed an agreed system because regions will have the responsibility to to certify, but we have to be sure that it is a, a national a national uh, system. Um, the, in, in third place, uh, regional governments will issue regulations. Directives, or in, in, in what sense, uh, to set up the, the certification process based on that agreement uh, reached by, by by all of us. We have the plan. I have to say also to start some pilot project in some specific region to uh, well to test if it works uh, easily or it provokes some problems before being general generalized. You know. And finally, and finally, we will we will go to the general process of certification. We we hope to have all the system developed in the first part of, of next year, 22, and have until the end of 24 to have this uh, process of, of uh, certification. Uh, we are working based on the on the on the experience we have acquired from uh, different European programs in some specific tools, like for instance, uh, a self, a self um, assessment, so to say, tool or, or self reflection tool, we call selfie for teachers. So it is based on the selfie, on, on the selfie program. And we are uh, adapting that uh, for doing something similar uh, for, uh, for, for teachers. And, and, and we are also uh, offering teachers uh, training adapted to the updated version of the national framework I, I, did, uh, before. I, I did refer before. So, um, uh, the, 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 I have to say that, as you can imagine, certification is not exactly as passing exams or something like that, but it is some, it's a continuous process in which teachers have to reflect and at the end have to demonstrate that they have acquired several competences and at the end they will they will get different kind of certifications adapted to to, to that we we are still in the process of, of defining all the elements but we, we we have worked a lot and we are working very hard to have it as as, as quickly as possible and we will be very happy to share that with the Commission and with other countries, because I think that, that such a challenge for us uh, should be of, of interest in your experience and maybe our experience to, to some of you. So thank you very much for your support and help. Uh Thank you, Professor Ferreira. You obviously heard my thoughts saying, yeah, we have to learn from that Spanish example, because I see in all countries we are thinking about developing digital competencies of teachers. So following someone's path and learning from someone's good or bad examples will be uh, our, our shared future, I would say. So our time is up. 
So I was really happy talking with all of you. Uh, thank you for all those insights. It was a pleasure to learn so much from you. And I believe our audience uh, enjoyed too. So looking forward to see all those plans happen in the countries. And let's make education better uh, together. So thank you one more time. And Konstantinos, back to you. and to all our guests for this very 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 nice discussion and uh, the exchange that happened and sharing information about what is happening on a european but also on a national level thank you for coordinating this uh, round table lydia and we now continue with our program thank you thank you have a nice afternoon you too moving on to the last part of this year's eminent 2021 we have the honor to welcome the address of miss sabine Verheyen, the chair of uh, the Education and Culture Committee of the European Parliament. Ms. Verheyen has been a member of the European Parliament for the German Christian Democrats since 2009, and in 2019, she got elected as chairwoman of the Committee for Culture and Education after being coordinator for the European People's Party uh, in this committee for five years. Furthermore, she is a member of the Special Committee on Disinformation and served as mayor of Aachen. Ms. Verheyen also focuses on issues related to local authorities. Welcome to our conference, and it's a pleasure to see you and have you with us today, Ms. Verheyen. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, honorable ministers and honorable members of the Commission, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, I would like to thank European Schoolnet very much for inviting me to address you today to speak some closing words on the conference where we discuss the lessons learned from the pandemic to shape the education to the future. First, let me say some personal words. In my opinion, the young generation, our children, are the ones who are suffering most from the COVID-19 restrictions, which are necessary to overcome this pandemic. Homeschooling, no social life, no birthday parties, no school trips, no sports, they comply with all the restrictions, they understand, they wear masks, they do their utmost to protect the older generations and the most vulnerable. They behave responsibly and it is now on us to take over responsibility towards them, to do our part and get the necessary vaccines so that the youth can go back to their social life. We owe this to them. We have heard a lot of interesting debates today on how these last two years of schooling looked like and what we can learn from that. This conference was meant as an opportunity to take stock of the lessons we have learned and prepare for the challenges of the future. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused massive disruptions to our education systems across Europe and indeed around the world. As education and training institutions closed their doors, so education and training went digital with mass distance and online learning. Our teachers and trainers showed remarkable creativity, but the fact is that many lack the skills and the teaching methods to make remote learning work. Much worse still, the sudden digital transition exposed huge gaps in every aspect of what makes digital education work. For some learners, there was simply no internet, no computer, or no mobile device. These are the absolute basics. You cannot learn online if you are not online in the first place. We also realized that focusing on digital infrastructure and equipment in schools, while very important, is not enough when everybody is trying to learn at home. And that's not all. Parents suddenly found themselves in the role of teachers, or least of education facilitator, helping children to learn online, often when they themselves lack basic digital skills. There is much evidence to suggest that those who already suffer disadvantage have fallen further behind. The last month, in short, has made existing social and educational inequalities much worse. We must put that right. One of the instruments to address this is the Digital Education Action Plan. As the Parliament stated in its position this year, embracing and maximizing the potential of digital technologies should go hand in hand with modernizing existing curricula and learning and teaching methods. We need improved connectivity for all schools, especially those in remote or rural areas. 
Support is also needed for training courses designed for teachers and the need to support parents and families in using digital tools and to improve digital skills, also via lifelong learning. Digital learning is a lifelong process and one that also takes place outside formal education and involves many different stakeholders. We need more support for non-formal learning and we need to make sure we help people of all ages acquire basic digital skills. A shift to a more hybrid model of education combining in-person classroom learning with e-learning solutions is inevitable. However, in-person learning must remain at the heart of education and training. School is more than just learning how to read and to calculate. It has a crucial social function for our societies and it shapes our future paths from an early age. We need to give serious thought to the right balance between in-person learning, which is essential, and digital technologies, which when used smartly can very effectively support in-person learning. Thus, better cooperation and coordination among the member states and a more ambitious union education and training policy is needed. The European education area should play a unique role in improving access to and the quality of education across the union. Establishing a common European system for the recognition, validation and certification of digital skills, qualifications and diplomas can bridge the digital divide in Europe. A digital education action plan needs to go hand in hand with the broader education policy framework and the broader digital agenda. That means the action plan must be aligned with the European skills agenda and the next steps in the European education agenda. And it must also complement efforts, for example, to expand internet, internet provisions. There is much talk about a new normal after the crisis, since change has been so profound. We do not yet know what that new normal will look, but we can be sure that things will not just return to the way they were before COVID-19. Policymakers should take this opportunity to reimagine what education can and should be in the 21st century. This means also, and here we need to look also at the national level, to rethink investment and budgetary priorities. Ladies and gentlemen, the fact is that the decisions we take today in the context of COVID-19 will have long-term consequences for the future of education and thus ultimately for our children. Policymakers, educators and communities are faced with high stakes choices, choices that will shape the future lives of our children and of our children's children. These decisions must be guided by shared principles and a clear collective vision of what we want the future to look like. The European Parliament representing EU citizens will play an active role at all stages of policymaking. The current situation has forced a rethink and we must seize the opportunity to think outside the box about how our education system can best deliver high quality learning opportunities for all our children to survive and thrive in today's rapidly changing and uncertain world. Together we can shape a bright future for education in Europe. We owe this to the youth. And 2022, the European Year of Youth, will definitely give us many opportunities to deliver on our promises. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Hein, for this very nice and inspirational speech and also for giving us the perspective of the parliament, sharing the kind of the priorities that the parliament has said, because as you said, this is the people's voice and it's very important to be also heard in such settings. Thank you very much for being with us and for kindly accepting our invitation. Have a good evening. And now, before closing with the words of our executive director, we would like to remind you that the visual exhibition is also accessible tomorrow. Moreover, we appreciate your feedback which you can share using the link that will appear as a notification on your screen in a moment. And now, the word to our executive director, Mr. Mark Durando, who will officially close Eminent 2021 online conference. From all of us here in Brussels, thank you for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Mark, good evening and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Konstantinos. Do you hear me? 
Yes. I hear you very well. Yes. Okay. So uh, many thanks, Constantinos, for your kind words. And uh, it's always a, a pleasure for, for me to, to have the opportunity to, to make the closing remarks at the annual conference of a network of ministries of education. And it is the first time in the history of European Schoolnet that we have organized Eminent Online. I hope all our audience enjoyed the keynote speeches and the roundtable discussions. This year, we had also the good fortune to have with us nine ministers, state secretaries, and I would like to thank each of them sincerely for having found the time to be with us and share their views and thoughts on the importance of the digital inclusion for the transformation of our education systems. Their presence today is the acknowledgement and the recognition of the work done by a network of ministries. I know we had a very long day and I will not summarize the main discussions which took place during the various sessions today. Let me simply share some thoughts. First, digital technologies have clearly grown and now have a significant presence in education. This has been reinforced by the COVID pandemic, where from one day to the next, all our education systems switched to an emergency remote teaching mode. Even though some of those involved faced difficult situations, not to mention new health management challenges for teachers and school leaders, this period has confirmed the importance of digital education solutions and how they can transform our education systems. Many issues have emerged during this complicated period of the pandemic, and I would like to highlight four of them which have been tackled already during the various discussion today. Infrastructure and connectivity, which have been particular challenges and which can themselves lead to greater levels of exclusion for already disadvantaged students. The digital skills of teachers and the pedagogical use of educational technology as mentioned by several of our ministers. The importance of developing even more innovative pedagogies and the organization of schools where new schooling models are gradually emerging. A fair number of countries are engaged in the digital transformation of their education system. I would like to highlight three elements from the discussion today. First, technology alone does not transform education as such. In plenty of situations, despite the increasing visibility of digital devices and online solutions, the essence of traditional education forms remain intact. We should now be looking for higher levels of innovation. And more particularly, it would be important to identify those learning activities where the use of educational technologies is beneficial and can really make the difference. And it should particularly apply to artificial intelligence education solutions. Second, the research tells us that digital technology does not systematically improve learning. It's only one of several factors which can contribute to finding new innovative solutions which support improving learning and Rose Luckin highlighted the potential of artificial intelligence in this context. Three, digital technology does not fix inequalities. And we discussed this issue extensively during our conference. And it does raise the challenge of how we can reimagine the technologies we use in education and explicitly design them to address issues of equity, diversity, and overcoming challenges. There is no doubt that this inclusion dimension will be and should be at the heart of the deliberations in our countries on transforming their education systems. This transformation of our education systems is supported by the Recovery and Resilience Facility instrument put into place by the European Commission. Ministries have drawn up their plan and submitted them to the Commission. The instrument presents a marvelous opportunity for our countries 
enabling them to develop new approaches and implement ambitious reforms to support the transformation of their system. The round, so this second round table this afternoon gave us the opportunity to hear about the plans of some countries and also to have a better overall picture of the strategy of the European Commission for supporting member states in that exercise. It is important to offer to our ministries of education a platform where they can exchange information about their respective plans and learn from practice and strategies in other countries. A U European school net as a unique network of ministries of education in Europe would be more than pleased to support these exchanges. This should certainly proceed in conjunction with the digital education hub, which the Commission is gradually developing. And this hub could provide also an ideal framework for all these exchanges, even if this dimension does not seem, according to the Commission representatives today, as an immediate priority. But we are convinced it is key to nurture exchange so that min our ministries can exchange their plans and how they implement them. There are plenty of challenges ahead of us. As I have already mentioned, new schooling models as, already, as, as identified and highlighted by some of our panelists are emerging. And these new models will have to fully integrate all or part of the 10 following elements. I have to reassure you, I will not go in so much details for all these 10 elements, but it's quite important that I can share with you this, this uh, particular aspect. First, the necessity to embed inclusion policies within the planned transformation processes. It is a responsibility to design educational technologies to address issues of inclusion, equity, and diversity. Second, the importance of better infrastructure, equipment, and connectivity, and for sure the RRF instrument will have a significant contribution for this. Third, the necessity to develop and implement appropriate privacy and safety policies, especially with the quick development of artificial intelligence education solutions, where a data privacy issue will be hot on the agenda of all our countries. Fourth, the centrality of digitally competent teachers, especially in the pedagogical use of educational technologies. It should also be connected, as Xavier Pratz-Money mentioned this morning, with appropriate induction programs for the new teachers entering the profession. Fifth, the value of sustaining innovation in educational solution by partnering even more with the edtech startup sector. We saw that the panorama of the publishing sector is in transformation, and it is important to have the and to develop the appropriate cooperation mechanisms in that context. Six, the vital need for, for schools to offer greater flexibility and responsiveness and for them to be even more open to their local community. This will involve a wider emergence of new shared leadership models. Seven, new assessment models, using the added value offered by technologies such as artificial intelligence and learning analytics, and it has been tackled at several occasions during this day. Eight, the need to further think through the reform of our curriculum, where this crisis has forced us to question whether we are not asking too much from our schools in terms of curriculum. Mr. Kerameus mentioned this modification of the curriculum in Greece. And we should question whether we should train our teachers on the use of artificial intelligence solutions. Should we educate our children to make the difference between facts and opinion? Should we develop even more social emotional skills at the level of our students? For sure, all the blended and hybrid teaching and learning models which are currently emerging will force us to revisit the current curriculum in all our countries. 
Nine, the need to look even more closely at ways of enhancing the autonomy of our students and to enhance their motivation for learning. Tenth, the essential role of stronger, closer, and more reactive monitoring systems at policy level. So there are the 10 elements I thought important sharing with you regarding how the emergence of these new schooling models could take place. But I would like to insist on one point which has not been tackled today. And uh, it is linked to that, the fact that all these new schooling models will have to be achieved in a more envir environmentally sustainable ways as the digital transition has to go hands with hands with a green transition. And it will be essential that this aspect will not be overlooked within the various reforms which will take place. The time has come now to officially close our eminent conference. I would like to thank particularly all our ministers and state secretaries who took the time to share their views and reflections during this day. And fortunately, the fact to have organized Eminent Online has offered us this opportunity of having our ministers with us, as for sure a face-to-face -face or physical event will not have enabled us to welcome nine ministers for that event. Secondly, our network of ministries of education which have supported us in the organization of this event. And I personally thank all our members for the trust they have in our European Schoolnet organization. Our keynote speakers, panelists, who have contributed to the success of this event. Our industry partners who have joined us for this event. And I saw from the chat that some of them have been very active. And with whom we have a strategic dialogue regarding the future of education. Of course, I would like also to thank all the audience today which decided to join us online. And we hope that all of you enjoyed the discussion which took place today. We had more than 780 registration for this event and we are very, and we are very happy that you had the opportunity to enjoy all the discussions. Finally, let me thank particularly our own team at European Schoolnet, without whom we would not have been in a position to organize this event. I would like particularly to thank Tommaso Della Vecchia, Konstantinos Andronikis, Laura Rinberg, Patricia Vastio, Jessica Massini, Andrea Panizza, Silvia Spinoso, Jonatas Batista, Denis Zenkin, Diana Buba, Eugenia Casariego, Lydia Crash. Alejandra Hernandez and Sinead Maguire, who have contributed to make this event such a success. So many colleagues working behind the scene have enabled us to, to really make this event a reality to this year. We'll share with you, of course, on the next days to come, the recording of our event, as well as some speeches from our ministers. Nobody can predict what eminent 2022 will look like. But we are confident about maintaining the benefit of our annual event to share our views on the importance of supporting the transformation of our education systems in Europe. I thank you very much for your time and I now officially close this event. Many thanks.